afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, one of the founders and COO of Kiwi, uh, and I'm here with my um, teammate, Robert, uh, who, uh, who you will hopefully get to meet, as, uh, especially during, uh, uh, during the session and afterwards as well. So we're here to tell you a little bit about what we do at Kiwi and uh, some of the takeaways we have had in, uh, in the context of machine learning as it relates to IoT. Um, so just a little bit of background about Kiwi and what we do or who we are. Um, our, our vision started out by imagining a, a future and a world where uh, electrical outlets are not just the dumb sources of electricity that they have been for the last century or so, uh, but rather they're actually a, a connected network of powerful sensors that make buildings more um, uh, safe, uh, more convenient, uh, more efficient. And uh, this was the vision that got Jennifer and myself, my co-founder, started on this path. We started doing this because we realized that we spent about 90% of our times in, indoors, inside buildings. And unlike our cars who, that tend to continually improve with technology, uh, buildings tend to lag behind quite a bit. Uh, they, they feel uh, crummy and, and uh, uh, quite static, and we wanted to change that. So, um, so as I was saying, when we think about buildings and the impact that they have, um, uh, at least from an energy perspective, which is uh, a big focus for Kiwi, uh, we, re uh, we see that buildings actually uh, consume the majority of the uh, energy use in, in, in the United States. Um, this, this data is as of 2018, uh, and compared to all industrial applications and all transportation, buildings were the largest consuming, uh, consumers of electricity. And so um, what that means is that being able to have a, make a change and have uh, uh, have a slight improvement in efficiency will have a huge economic and environmental impact, which is what motivates us on a daily basis. Uh, when we look at building efficiency, um, uh, recent data have shown that uh, about 40% of that energy use comes from uh, electronic appliances that get plugged into the wall outlets. Uh, these are things that are not hardwired, uh, and for that we use a term called plug loads. Uh, and uh, what the Department of Energy uh, has indicated is that in 2017, they, uh, they estimated that at about 40%, and they're actually es uh, estimating that it will continue to grow uh, to about 49% by 2040. So clearly, it's, it's a big problem, and it's growing. And it's not a surprise we all have uh, a very different lifestyles uh, now as compared to even 10 years ago. Uh, we all use and operate a whole lot more electronic appliances, and we bring those inside our, our, the built environment and the buildings. And so that it, it, makes, it makes total sense, but it's a problem that hasn't been addressed. And what makes this, uh, these plug loads difficult to manage is, of course, their massive scale. There are about 20 billion outlets in the US alone. Um, and unfortunately, there's currently no infrastructure for monitoring or controlling them. Um, when it comes to building management industry, there's a saying that, they, that, that says, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. And uh, the electrical outlets and plugs definitely fall in that category. And lastly, um, because occupants like us uh, here, who don't necessarily think about how a building runs, they are the ones interfacing with uh, the electrical outlets and the plug loads, um, their behavior ends up affecting the performance uh, of the building overall. And so um, what we do at Q is we try to address all these issues through uh, the power of using big data and occupant engagement to bring about uh, a solution for plug loads that brings more efficient and more comfortable buildings around. We are a software company, and our focus has been to, um, to use data uh, to bring, bring these changes about. In our short company history, we've been around for about three years. We have been very fortunate to work with uh, leading institutions like uh, SFO, uh, Stanford University, MasterCard, and even the Los Angeles Unified School District. And um, what these institutions have been working with us on has been uh, to address, address the problem that I, that I mentioned earlier. The way we do this is that we believe data is the key in, in unlocking uh, the, this, uh, this problem and addressing this issue. So you may have seen a lot of smart plugs out there. You may have them in your homes. You may be familiar with some of them. Um, and we're, I'm here to tell you that we're different from them. So you may, you may have seen 
Uh, devices like this, which I'm happy to show, uh, show you more afterwards as well, you can come up. Um, they collect data as a, you know, in the form of current and, and voltage as a function of time. So it's a time series data. Um, and what all plug manufacturers do is that at best they display that data to their customers. What we do, however, is that we actually take it um, a few steps further than that. So what that means is that we use the basic data and we uh, extract core analytics from it. So we're able to answer questions like, what is getting plugged in? Who's using it? Where is it located? And how is it being used? What this does is that it essentially generates an automatic uh, um, inventory uh, that updates real time, and that makes the lives of these building managers a lot easier. We don't stop there. We can actually go further in that we extract we, uh, business insights from the way that the electrical outlets are used. So we're able to now start predicting how the building is going to be utilized and answer questions like, uh, what's a good schedule for a, for a device to be set? And uh, when can we turn it off so that we can avoid electricity waste? Um, will, it, will a device fail during a critical time? And if so, um, will the manager, the building manager, uh, have, have to uh, scramble to fix that issue? And lastly, um, how is that space being used? Is, uh, we know in San Francisco, for example, uh, rent is extremely expensive, and uh, companies try to minimize uh, waste as much as possible, and we're able to answer questions like that. So, um, one, one example that we may all identify with is, this is all in the commercial space, uh, but in the residential space, um, imagine grandpa uh, or grandma uh, normally uses uh, uh, her um, coffee maker at 9 a.m. in the morning, um, and one, one morning she doesn't. Uh, we're able to automatically alert the caretaker to go check up on her. Uh, so we're able to extract a, a, a whole lot of value from, um, from the outlet data by utilizing the data in a, in, a, in a smart way. Our solution is a vertically integrated hardware software analytics layer. Um, what we do on the hardware side <clears throat> excuse me, is that we add uh, custom firmware to existing off-the-shelf uh, plugs and um, enable them to co uh, collect uh, current and, and uh, voltage data uh, in a way that is scalable. So we are able to deploy uh, hardware that's typically targeted towards uh, residential uh, applications for large commercial buildings and have uh, hundreds and thousands of nodes operating at the same time. We enable data, uh, data flow from the customer site to our cloud server um, where um, the magic happens and we have interfaces both for the building managers uh, in the form of a web app as well as for the building occupants uh, like us in the form of a, mo a mobile app to enable uh, everybody looking at the same data and, and getting their incentives aligned. What we want to focus on in, in the conversation today is uh, sort of share with you uh, some of our experiences and, and learnings in using ML when it comes to IoT data and what are some of the implications for that and what are some of the tricks we've, we've been able to use that have worked well. So in that context, uh, I want to talk about two features that use ML um, that we are extremely excited about because this will keep, uh, I'll, I'll keep referring back to these two features throughout the, call, uh, the, con um, the conversation here. So the first one is automated device classification. Um, you can think of the, uh, the, the current um, uh, data as a function of time uh, as being a signature for a particular device. That signature is different for a laptop versus a fridge versus a uh, desktop computer, for example. And we have been able to use ML to uh, classify different types of devices into, uh, into different categories. Again, what this does is that it makes the, the jobs of the uh, building managers a lot easier because now they have a, an automatic inventory uh, that updates real time and they don't have to worry about managing manually thousands and thousands of um, electronic appliances. That's the first feature. Uh, the second feature is uh, what we call learned scheduling. This is in the context of uh, 
enabling waste, uh, electricity waste especially, to be eliminated from, uh, from the use of electronic appliances. So uh, we look at the past usage pattern of a particular appliance, and we can uh, predict whether in the next 15 minutes or not uh, the plug or the appliance needs to be on. If so, we turn the plug on, um, and if, if not, we actually shut the uh, shut the plug off. And so um, this is analogous to some extent to the, um, the automated uh, faucets, for example, that you see at the sink. If nobody's in front of them, there's no water flowing, whereas if, if somebody actually is wanting to use it, then that's when the water flows. A similar analogy, but ex except in the context of electricity. So those are a couple of features that we're excited about, and uh, we'll, we'll be referring to those as we talk about this. When we zoom in on the sort of left-hand side of that previous slide, um, where, the, um, where the IoT network is, I want to zoom in to that a little bit and, sh uh, and tell you guys a little bit more about how we do that and how that's set up. Uh, so we have the, the smart plugs uh, that connect wirelessly uh, to a central gateway. Um, both of these have our custom firmware, and they enable a, uh, a, a, a well-orchestrated network of, and, and communication. Um, the gateway is uh, specifically designed so that it requires only outbound access to the internet, and this is important from a, from a fire, uh, firewall setting and also a security setting, uh, given that we're dealing with um, uh, building systems. So, from there, the, the, the data flows to our cloud, and if we were to focus a little bit more on, on the cloud side of things, um, we, use an, uh, we, uh, we use a system where we have two different uh, sets of uh, data flow. Our high-resolution data, um, which is about uh, once every second or once every minute at most, uh, gets uh, routed to, to Redshift, uh, and that's where a lot of our real-time processing happens. Um, on, on the other hand, uh, our low-resolution data, which is fed to uh, a Postgres database on Heroku uh, and is used for the uh, user uh, interfaces, is actually um, uh, aggregated uh, from seconds to minutes and then hours, and that's what, that's what the rest of the interfaces use. I guess in, a, uh, in an isolated, controlled environment, lab environment, um, all of, all of this seems pretty simple, and there is nothing um, that one needs to be aware of. Um, however, what makes IoT interesting, uh, especially from a data analysis perspective, uh, is that there are a lot of um, unexpected uh, challenges that come up. And um, the main and the, mo <laughs> the most difficult part of challenges are, are the people. So we have uh, physical uh, parts of our system that are being uh, touched and used by individuals. And, um, uh, you'd be surprised to know what people can, can do with these things. So we've had situations where uh, they just unplug the, the sensors. They, we've had um, situations where they get destroyed. Uh, they, uh, sometimes they do get stolen, unfortunately. And uh, not to name any names, but I think it was a few months ago we actually had somebody spill juice over the sensors. And so stuff happens. Um, and this is important from a, from a data analysis perspective and, uh, and a data management perspective because you can never expect things that people can, can actually end up doing with the sensors. It makes for an interesting uh, uh, work environment for sure. The second category are the sensors themselves. So as much as we'd like to think that hardware manufacturing process is robust, uh, in reality, uh, each of these uh, units can actually have uh, issues. So they can be calibrated, um, or, or they, they can lose calibration. Uh, they can um, not, it, it is possible that some units don't uh, collect data or they don't tra transmit data. So that ends up affecting data quality and also the um, uh, 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 the integrity of the data as well. And lastly, our uh, networking can be affected. So the wireless network between the plugs and the, and the gateway on site uh, can, be, can be blocked. Um, uh, we can't help it if somebody all of a sudden decides to put a, um, a metallic closet right in front of our gateway, blocking essentially all communication. Or if we lose power uh, to, to, what, to the plugs or the 
uh, the gateway itself, uh, that, that leads to data loss. And uh, lastly, because of, because of that, we end up with a variable data frequency, which, which makes it interesting from a, from a data processing perspective. So um, as part of the talk today, we wanted to share with you uh, a few tools that we have learned in our experience with using IoT data and machine learning at the same time and share those with you uh, so that you can add that to your, to your toolbox in case it's relevant to what you guys do in your, in your work as well. So the first set of tools uh, we capture are under this umbrella of expect the, un expect the unexpected. And what we mean by that is, of course, all the challenges I just ex explained, um, especially as a small, young company, it's impossible for us to imagine that we are, what we have currently in our database is everything that could possibly happen. So we have to uh, build ourselves against the, the risk of coming into unexpected situations. And uh, we have some tools we want to share with you in terms of how to do that. So, uh, the first tool we want to highlight is in uh, the process of uh, uh, model development. What you want to focus on, and, and the takeaway here is that you want to focus on what we call good data, quote unquote, and that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean uh, regularly occurring data, um, data without missing uh, data points or uh, high quality data. You can define it however you want, um, but the point is to start out your modeling with good data before uh, you give it, um, give it the more challenging ones. Because if it's not able to handle the, uh, the, the good quality data, there's no way that it would be able to handle the, the more messy types of data. So uh, you want to avoid the situation where you end up with garbage in, garbage out, uh, unfortunately. So what you're seeing here as an example is uh, uh, our power wattage uh, data as a function of time uh, for a particular monitor. So in the context of uh, learned scheduling, the feature that I mentioned where we automatically turn off equipment, uh, you see that for this particular monitor over four days, there is actually a pretty well um, re regulated um, repeating of, of the um, of the usage pattern. So you see, you see the monitor being used over time, or during the day over time, and at night it shuts down, and that's where you see the, um, the plateaus at zero. Now, compare this against um, a situation like this for the, for the exact same days and a, a different monitor, and it's, uh, uh, it's not behaving as you would expect. So either the monitor is, uh, is staying on or there has been a challenge with the plug or the, uh, or the networking of some sort. Um, and the takeaway here is if you are developing uh, a model, you want to start out with number one to make sure that you build it robust enough to handle the, um, the easy scenario before you start feeding it the more challenging one. Um, of course, as you build your model, you can always continue to evolve it and make it better so that ultimately it is able to handle situations like number two. But before that, uh, don't do that. And of course, for us as a, as a young startup with a small team, uh, we, want to be a, be, we want to be sure that we're spending time on developing a model that will pay off. So this is extremely important to, to run this test before you do uh, any real um, development. The second one is a trick that uh, is uh, somewhat talked about even uh, in, in the last talk a little bit. Uh, the idea is to be able to generate data. So um, again, for us as a, as a young startup, um, we don't necessarily have a huge data set. So when we're trying to do um, all the classification, defining the, uh, the type of the, uh, equipment that are getting plugged into the plugs using their signature, um, what we noticed when we first started working on this feature that, is that we had a lot of data on uh, laptops and monitors just by the nature of the deployments and the clients we've had. Uh, but we had a lot fewer when it came to uh, fridges and microwaves. So we had to be creative in terms of creating uh, data sets that were complete and, and comparable so that our model was able to distinguish all of those. So we used... Um, we use three different types of approaches to bring that about. Uh, the first one uh, we call uh, point noise. So uh, we start out with a, uh, with a sample data um, 
you can imagine this is the use of a laptop during the day, uh, and it's shut, shut off after the person goes home. Um, that's that top um, data set. So what we do is we use the same sample, and we essentially create three new uh, sets of samples from that. Um, by point noise, we introduce uh, noise in the uh, sample data points uh, locally uh, to allow the model to establish and evaluate a scenario where uh, there are variations either because of be uh, occupant behavior or device behavior, and we bring that in. Uh, and that's the red line you see in the, the bottom graph. The other approach we use is sample noise, where we uh, shift the, uh, the, the entire sample up and down, and this can simulate having a different laptop or having a scenario where a plug is, uh, has a slightly different calibration and therefore uh, systematically higher or lower than the other ones. And the last scenario uh, is, uh, is what we call time shift. Um, this is to uh, enable the model to see a scenario where, uh, where the, the laptop, for example, isn't necessarily just being used during the hours of the day, but rather it's being used in, in the evening. And so uh, the entire sample is, is getting shift in time. So through this effort, we have been able to quickly um, allow the model to see the situations that we haven't necessarily yet seen in the real world, uh, and we've been able to increase our, our sample size through this approach. The next um, tool that we want to recommend is uh, obviously uh, one for monitoring the pipeline performance. So um, I'll, I'll walk through this through uh, the example of, of the chart that's, that's here. Uh, this is in the context of our learned scheduling feature, as I mentioned earlier. And um, our, our model uh, at this point had only seen data from um, uh, March 10th and March 11th, which happened to be uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so it had only seen weekend data up to that point. It was too early in the process for it to be able to uh, correctly assume uh, and, and predict a um, a behavior. So on Monday, when people showed up, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we, ha we saw if, uh, an increase in uh, the number of false negatives that were, were occurring. The false negative is when uh, the, the plug has to be on, but it's actually turned off, meaning that it's being used, yet the model assumes that it has to be turned off. And that's a bad scenario, because the last thing you want are a bunch of angry uh, clients wanting to use their appliances and there's no power. Uh, so we had set up a, um, a specific monitoring that only looked looked at uh, the false negative scenarios. And as soon as that false negative hit a threshold, that was when we knew we had to roll up our sleeves and, and get in there and, and at least manually address, address the, the issue. Um, you can also imagine the same scenario if uh, in, in the world of a startup, uh, all of a sudden everybody has to come in all hands on a, on a Saturday and all their electronics are off because the model doesn't expect people to be in on Saturdays. Uh, so the point is to make sure to monitor that and of course uh, be on call and ready to address it manually if something like that does happen. So um, these three uh, points are, are the situations where something unexpected happens and you have to react accordingly and you have to set up yourself well for success there. The other set of tools that I want to share with you are uh, more the scenario where we know what challenges exist. Uh, we've already sort of talked about them previously, and now these are some tools that you can use for the challenges that you know about and how to address them. So that's, uh, what we want to do is uh, essentially minimize the effects of the challenges that you know you're going to see. So um, the first example is uh, for uh, a recommendation, especially when you're dealing with IoT networks, is to incorporate system health information. So we spent a lot of time building the, uh, the IoT network, but we probably just spent just as much time, if not more, uh, building the monitoring system for the, for the uh, physical world as well. And so uh, this is probably going to be uh, best understood by looking at the, at the chart here. What you see here are the hourly data for um, a, a monitor, a computer monitor uh, data as a function of time uh, over, um, over about a month. So uh, you see regular periods of, uh, of off or zero usage, which one may typically associate with the weekends. And um, 
when we feed this data to our model and, and uh, try to uh, estimate the probability of uh, the monitor being used on a Friday, if we were to just look at this data, what we would assume is that um, on March 22nd and March 29th, which both happen to be Fridays, the plug is off, therefore there is a high probability that uh, this monitor isn't being used on Fridays. So that would be one conclusion, but then when we overlay the system health uh, information on top, what you see in the red is the uh, failure rate of communication between the plug and the gateway. Uh, you all of a sudden notice that uh, around the March 22nd time frame, there were actually four days of network outage. Uh, and so the, the, the data was, uh, was indicating or was lost in that period, and it was zero, essentially, but the model didn't know the difference. So here, the probability of the plug being turned off on a Friday is actually much higher because we exclude that, uh, those four days. And this has especially been important from a from a data analysis perspective and reporting perspective as well, because uh, challenges like this do happen um, in, in the physical world. The second set of um, tools is, um, or the trick I should say, that we learned uh, was extremely useful was in transforming data from uh, um, sort of a, a continuous platform to discrete. Uh, this was especially important uh, when we look at uh, different types of equipment. So our system needs to be able to handle um, uh, devices regardless of whether they're a laptop or a monitor or whatever else may, they may be. And when we look at um, power data as a function of time, again, this is hourly for a particular monitor, you see that something like a 17 watt um, a reading for this monitor is actually at it, it means that the monitor is running at full capacity. When we look at the same uh, type of plot for a laptop instead, um, a 17 watt usage is actually probably indicating standby. It's not at, at full capacity, yet our models in being able to understand when to turn equipment on or off or when to, um, uh, how to detect the different types of equipment, they need to be able to use all the data regardless of um, the, the performance and the time and the type of devices that they are. And so um, the, the trick that has worked really well for us in this context has been to transform the continuous data, hourly data, for example, into, into discrete. So instead of looking at wattage as a, t a function of time, we start looking at the, at the state instead. So for the monitor, it ends up being a binary uh, uh, set of data in that the monitor is either on or off. Um, and for the laptop, uh, it ends up having three states. So it's either on and fully in use, or it's on standby, or it's uh, completely turned off. So what this enables us to do now is to feed the, uh, the same data uh, and, and uh, to the same model and enable it to uh, look at all, um, all of them at the same time. What's really cool about this is that this particular futurization is actually uh, using uh, ML in itself. So we're using ML to help another ML process, which I think uh, is pretty awesome. So um, in summary, uh, we, have, um, we wanted you to, to walk away with some takeaways in terms of uh, specific tools that you can use, especially in the context of IoT, if that's what you're, uh, what you're working on. And um, we're happy to, to talk more about that either during office hours or during uh, the, the networking event. But before closing out, I want to I wanna say a special thanks to you guys for being here uh, and a special thanks to Robert uh, who is here and uh, uh, most of this work uh, is, uh, is thanks to his hard work. So uh, with that, I want to thank you and see if you guys have any questions. Do you have to worry about privacy issues in your work in this company because you're basically inferring what type of appliances people are using and when they're using it and things like that? Yeah, um, good question. So um, uh, the types of clients that we have had so far, obviously, are commercial, commercial states, uh, commercial buildings um, that uh, own the entire set of, um, you know, uh, they, they own the building and they, they own everything that's in it. So from, a, uh, from the perspective of our clients, um, it's something that it's under their umbrella and they have to manage. Um, 
Of course, uh, there's a lot that, uh, that can be inferred from it, but it's used in the context of uh, business applications. And, and uh, what we um, typically do is that we don't actually include any um, personally ident identifiable information with that. Uh, so what we collect is essentially current uh, and voltage as a function of time. Um, the rest of it, uh, which is the personally ident identifiable, we don't collect and we don't display. Uh, so that's how we ad address that issue. Um, what's your training set? <clears throat> so let's say you've never seen a hair dryer. Um, how do you like manually collect data about plug-in different hair dryers and yeah, yeah, good question. So I'll kick that off and I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let Robert expand on that. Or do you, Robert, do you want to just talk about sure. it? Yeah. Sure, yeah, so for the most part, most of the devices that we're working with are ones that are pretty common in offices. So a lot of monitors, a lot of laptops, laptop docks, uh, desktops, but we have done a little bit of work on mining our own data where we actually sort of try to create network effects and get people to get their friends to plug in the craziest things in their houses uh, so we can get a little bit more of that. But it does help that we're mostly focused on similar kinds of deployments everywhere that we go. With that, if you are interested in having data collected, um, let us know. We could, <laughs> we could lend you some of these. Um, what, what? Hello, hello. Okay, um, one one question I had. I noticed that um, Los Angeles School District was one of the. Um, I, I used to work at a school district, and we were not allowed to have coffee makers. I think mm -hmm. it was like a fire concern or something like that. Do you use currently use um, the system as like an enforcement thing? So like the the school district can say, "There's there's a coffee maker here. We're going to remove it." And. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So, um, not to pick on on LAUSD or anything, but um, our our clients that that actually is pretty common, not just for school districts, but even at um, uh, at companies. There are certain types of equipment that are not allowed at an airport. You can imagine there are uh, safety issues, so there are certain types of equipment that should not be allowed. Um, we haven't had clients use that in that context. They would just like to know about it uh, so that they can be prepared uh, for, for, the, for the situation when something, or if something were to happen. So um, at, at LAUSC specifically, uh, as an example, um, uh, they have been interested in, in knowing what uh, is going on inside the schools. They have a thousand schools, uh, a lot for them to manage, and uh, their electricity bills, of course, are, are increasing at a 5% rate per year. Uh, so it's, it's a huge problem. And uh, the main issue when we first met them was that they didn't even know if electronic appliances were something that they had to worry about or not. So uh, giving them that first layer of visibility into this is what is going on inside your buildings was really what they they were focused on rather than uh, sort of enforcement of rules at that point. Any other questions? Well, I have a remark, which is that it seems like a lot of what you figured out is that there's a real story in the real world behind what, what the data has. So for example, when you were showing how there were missing points, but it was actually because the device was off, that's something you can only know by knowing the real world behind your data. Um, do you think that IoT is unique in this regard? That's a good question. Um, I, I feel like it can't be unique. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things about IoT that makes it fun uh, to work on. Um, but knowing, knowing information, uh, when it comes to model development and doing anything with the data, uh, any sort of quantitative or even qualitative data you may know is going to be helpful in what you do in, in analyzing your data. So um, I, uh, in the context of that, that can't be unique to IoT, even if, uh, you know, for us, we need to know what may have happened at the deployment. We actually make a point of knowing, okay, at which customer side did we, did we get a call? Uh, who's, who's been uh, uh, complying well and who hasn't? So we, we even keep this information in mind to know what uh, good data sets we may have code and code and which ones to first feed into the model. So we, we use uh, data that's captured, that's not captured within the database to, uh, to affect our modeling. And I don't think that's, I don't, I don't assume, I can't presume that that's unique to IoT.